Hi, Hi Renee. How, How are, are you? you? Hello, Gabby. Fine. Thank you. And you? Fine. I am really happy to have you here tonight and have you as a speaker. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ms. Renee. Renee is an educator from Pinos. She came from a long, long way to Guatemala. She's from Cape Town, South Africa, and she's been with Pinos since the very beginning of Pinos. So she's going now to her fourth year, right, Renee? She has experience of teaching. She, that goes way back to nine years, she was teaching for nine years in South Africa and near Abu Dhabi. And she also was, before that, she was working for another nine years with special kids, with special needs kids. So she has a lot of experience with our children. And now she is teaching the class six in Trinos. So Rene, we have the pleasure to have you here tonight. And today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, adversity, an opportunity to build resilience. So Rene, I leave you with all this beautiful family. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I hope that you are all warm tonight. It's very cold here in zone 14. Um, now, when I was preparing for tonight, you know, I thought it, back in February 2020, I don't think any of us would have predicted that come September 2020, we would be or have been living in our homes for the last six months nearly, that we would be living with our lives controlled by a virus that has changed every single thing. Yet here we are, um, the 3rd of September, and this is the topic for our first talk for the Trinus Growing Up Together, adversity and how we can use that as an opportunity to build resilience. So I want to start with giving a definition of resilience. And the Merriam-Webster Merriam Dictionary defines resilience as the capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation caused by compressive stress. So we can think of a rubber ducky or a stress ball. You squeeze it, and the minute you let go, it bounces back. It goes on to say that resilience is the ability to recover or adjust easily to misfortune or change. And um, I don't know about you, but I definitely do not adjust easily to misfortune or change. At the moment, we're dealing with death, we're dealing with fear, we're dealing with businesses um, going out of business. There's not maybe enough money. We're all having to change every single aspect of our lives. And I think one of the scariest things is that we don't know when this will end. And we don't know how is this going to end? What is this going to look like once it is over? Is it ever going to be over? Um, now, my journey through this pandemic has been one of constantly having to bounce back, bounce back from disappointments, um, bounce back from changing the entire way that my year was going to look. Um, this is the first time that I haven't gone back home to South Africa um, at least once a year. So this is now the longest time that I haven't gone back home. Um, we all having to change the way that we do our work and I've had to find ways to personally learn how I was going to go through this. And um, just when I think I have things under control and, and I'm, I'm breathing and I'm flowing, along comes something else, whether it's something from the government or something that changes for work or whether it's something that's happened in my personal life or whether it's a family member or a close friend suffering. Um, this is what this time has been like. And in my personal journey, I have found the researcher and author, Brené Brown, to be incredibly valuable in um, my understanding of what I want to do or things that I can do to move forward through this. Now, in her book, um, The Gifts of Imperfection, she talks of cultivating a resilient spirit as one of the guideposts to healthy, wholehearted living. And what was very interesting for me is that in this chapter, she outlines five factors or five things that resilient people do. There's five characteristics of what resilient people do and who they are. So 
for me, this was incredibly powerful. And I decided to work backwards from these five things. So if these are five things that resilient people do, what are things that we can do as parents, as educators, as adults who are helping other people, what are things that we can do? So the five things she identified are, number one, they are problem solvers. They are good at problem solving and they are very resourceful. The second thing resilient people do is they are more likely to seek help. The third thing, they hold the belief that they can do something that will help them manage their feelings and cope. Number four, they have social support available to them. And number five, they are connected with others such as family and friends. So this is where I'm starting, that these are five things that resilient people do. So then how can we help our children to become the people who will do these things? And um, right here, right now, I need to give you all the bad news. And the bad news is that our children learn through us. And that is something that we can not ever forget, something that we can never separate from anything that we want our children to learn. So that means that it's us who are going to decide and determine how resilient our children learn to be. So from now on, I don't want you to think of this as how can I help him, how, how can I help my child be more resilient? I want us to start thinking, how can I be more resilient? What do I need to do in order to build my resilience? Because that is what our children are going to learn from. So parents, right now, all of us, we need to know. And whenever or whatever I say, I want you to be thinking, okay, how resilient am I? because that is the only way we are going to help our children learn to be resilient. And that is also going to be the most powerful gift you can give your children through this time, is you showing them your resilience. So the first thing is that people who are resilient, people who somehow can bounce back, people who can pick themselves up again, the first thing that they are is that they are good problem solvers and that they are resourceful. So straight away, one of the first things we have to accept is that problems exist in life. We all have problems, every single one of us. And um, some of us have problems which don't look too bad to other people. So for example, I have a lot of mom friends, friends who are mothers or parents, and they just envy the fact that I have space in my house and I have time and I can eat a meal in peace without anybody asking me 500 questions because I um, am living alone in my apartment. And I look at them and I think, but my goodness, you have people to eat dinner and lunch and breakfast with, and you can get hugs whenever you want. So we all have problems, but our problems might not look, to prob look like problems to other people. And it's basically the only thing we can hope is that our problems become better problems. There's, there's no way to escape the fact that they our problems and problems will come up in life. So we need to help our children to be problem solvers because problems are going to come up in life. Now, one of the, the most special ways that we can do this with our children, especially the younger ones, is by growing and stimulating their imagination, letting them dream into possibilities, letting them be able to imagine different things because imagination is what matures and what grows into clear and logical and rational thinking. So letting your children play with their toys, letting them dress up, letting them imagine that a box is a spaceship, these things might seem small and insignificant, but that is what teaches your children about possibilities. And later when we're adults, this is often where we get stuck. We don't see possibilities. We only know this is the way, this is the only way I know how to do things. But if we had more of an imagination, we could be able to see more possibilities. So give your children space to solve problems. Let them learn to enjoy trying and failing. Let them learn to enjoy trying and succeeding. Um, you know, discuss situations around the dinner table and listen to their ideas. Now, of course, you don't have to listen to what they say. You don't have to do anything that they suggested. But just the fact that you listened, that just shows them, oh, okay, so we can share ideas and, and maybe I will be a part of the solution. Um, let, with older children, so when your children are maybe from nine and older, let them decide something. 
and then let them deal with the consequences. So if they decide that they want to put salt into the cake to try and make a different, let them do it and then let them eat it and let them be like, this is the most disgusting cake I've ever tasted. They will then know, okay, that idea didn't work. Next time I will try something else. Um, the only way to learn good problem solving skills is to solve problems. The only way to learn if you can trust yourself is to try something and see, yes, I did that well, or no, I didn't do that well. Unfortunately, that is the only way you can build your, well, unfortunately, but I know you want to protect your children from the, from problems, but protecting them doesn't prepare them or set them up for real life. And trust, self-trust is one of the keys to being a good problem solver, to being resourceful, knowing that, okay, I can figure something out on my own or I can ask somebody for help, but to just feel that, okay, this is a problem and I'm going to, to sort this out. Find situations in which you can encourage your children to trust themselves. So things like letting them climb a tree, you know, instead of um, saying, no, 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 that's too high, let them go, you know? Um, this is maybe an extreme example, but pain is such a good teacher. You know, if uh, maybe we can all remember the first time we touched a hot stove or we touched something hot and our parents said, don't do that. And we did it anyway. After that first burn, you are much less likely to go and touch that hot thing again. Um, emotional pain, you know, suffering through the loss of a beloved pet in the family. I mean, that is something that can be so traumatic for everybody. So instead of hiding that and not crying in front of your children because you don't want them to see you crying, let them see you cry. Let them see you sad. Let them see you in pain. And that is going to really help them know how to manage pain because pain, like problems, is something we cannot avoid in life. So um, these are little ways that we can help our children become better problem solvers by learning to trust themselves. Now, our job in this is we have to show them and guide them through the process of solving problems. So let them see you sometimes thinking out loud. Um, let them see when you made a mistake. L tell them when you did something wrong. You know, in my classroom, I will say, if I make a math mistake on the board or something like that, I will say, oh, it's because I put an extra zero instead of, you know, so, so I let them know what I did wrong. And then I let them in that way be a part not only of my mistake, but then also how I'm going to fix it. They need to see us make mistakes. They need to see us being okay to make mistakes because then that gives them the freedom and the confidence to make mistakes. And of course, when you're trying to figure out your problems, of course, when you're trying to see what you can do and make something out of a situation, of course, you are going to make the wrong choice every now and then. So let your children be a part of that. Let them see you succeed, of course. Let them also see you fail sometimes, just so they can know, oh, okay, that's a normal that's a normal thing. So just think about, do you hide your mistakes from children? Do you only tell them when you have succeeded? Or can you make them part of your problem solving process? Because we are the ones who have to teach them how to solve problems. They need to see us thinking something through. They need to see us taking a step that doesn't work. And in that way, they learn how to solve problems. The second characteristic of resilient people, and I really like this one, they are more likely to seek help. So here there's a few things that we can think about. Number one, I think we have this culture of asking for help as a weakness. So I'm going to just do whatever I can, even if I don't know what I'm doing, but no one will see me asking for help. No one will see that weakness. I am strong. I've got this. Um, moms, you know, this is something where I feel I'm talking specifically to you. I know mothers carry so much and you will make it look on the surface as if there's nothing going, nothing going on. You're just breezing through life. Mom has got everything. She's doing the shopping. She's working. She's making sure that the children are connected to Zoom. Sorry, dads. I know that you are also here sometimes. Um, but moms, this is something that you carry. And I want you to just think about what are you showing your children? Now, I know a lot of you are saying, Miss P, Miss P, if I don't do it, no one is going to do it. Well, so what? You know, let children see or let people see that Sometimes you cannot carry everything. 
Another aspect of, of carrying things and not asking for help is that you then um, almost wear that as a, as a pride. You know, I'm so busy. I've got so much going on, but look at me. I'm managing it. And then children learn, oh, okay, so that's what you do. You just carry everything and you say everything's fine and, and mommy's okay or dad's okay. And we're actually not. And in that way, we are then giving our children the same thing we have of just acting like everything's fine on the surface. We are not teaching them that it's okay to ask for help. And also, when we don't ask for help, we don't give someone the opportunity to help us. Yeah? So that's also something very clear. Ask your children for help. And of course, they're going to say, no, they don't want to clean. They don't want to do this. But ask them for help and then let them help you. And with the younger ones, you know, you can turn it into games or a fun way or a fun thing to play. But just this whole to change this culture around asking for help, because that's something that this pandemic has taught me. I am not able to go through this on my own. There's been times when I've had to ask for technical help. I mean, I don't know, I don't know anything. Well, before this, I knew even less about Zoom, online stuff. I didn't even have Wi-Fi before the pandemic started. And I've since had to ask people to show me things that are quite basic for, for most of the people that I had no idea what to do. I've also had to ask for help when I um, haven't been able to leave my apartment and have people come and um, bring me things when I wasn't able to go and get that for myself. So, I mean, that's ways that um, we need to show our children. I don't have children, so I wasn't showing anyone. I was just showing myself. But that is something that I would like you to consider because when you ask for help and your children see you asking for help, when they can help you, in that way you just create this flow of this is what we do. We help one another. And when I don't know what to do, I can ask for help. Something else that we need to remember is to teach children how to ask the right people for help. Mm -hmm. So we need to also do that. Mm -hmm. So I can't ask um, my neighbor who barely knows me to do this thing for me and then be disappointed that he doesn't. Or I can go to the right person and ask them the right thing. Because asking the wrong person for help, that's not teaching anyone anything. That's just setting you up to go, I knew it, here we go again, I need to carry this on my own. So please think about who are you asking for what help. So, um, you know, you won't ask your four-year-old to um, maybe <laughs> hold your hand while you are trying to cross the street or something like that. But you can make that age appropriate. And that is something that um, we also have to be very aware about, that we are making sure that we are teaching our children in an age-appropriate way. Um, also connected with asking with this with this um, characteristic of asking for help is let your children see that they can trust you. Yeah. So when they need help, are you there to help them? Of course, we can't help them with every single thing, especially now that every single thing they need help with. But in those important and crucial moments, are we there for them that when they ask for help, they learn that they can get that help from the people that they trust? And in that way, also, we can help them learn to be open to relying on other people, the right people. So here, I would like to encourage you to let your children see you being, and I don't like the word weak, maybe the, the better word is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So let's start seeing asking for help as me being vulnerable, and let's teach our children that that's okay. It is okay to ask for help. It is okay to be vulnerable. And that's actually a strong choice to do that. It is a strong choice. It's an empowered choice to say, I don't know what to do. I'm going to ask somebody to help me. Um, another thing in terms of this, I'm going to have to tell you that you're going to have to give up control. So if you ask for help or you want help with the chores or the children need to clean the, the, um, the hair of the dog's bed or whatever, and they don't do it exactly like you say, and they don't do it at the exact moment that you want them to do it, you need to let go of that control because what you are teaching them is more important than the fact that the dog's bed is actually clean. For sure, they need to do what they need to do properly, but also they can have space to do it on their own. And if they their problem solving is to, oh, I'm just going to do a, a half job and not do it properly, then the consequence is that they're going to have to do it again. So in that way, again, you are teaching them, okay, so if I'm solving my problem by being lazy and trying to just get out of washing the bed, 
my dad's going to make me wash it again. And that is so important. So think of those moments also where you need to give up control, where you need to step back. Or if your child's job is to um, cook, peel the potatoes, and they don't peel the potatoes, and that night nobody has potatoes for supper, well, then that's the consequence of their actions. So be open to asking for help. Let your children see you being vulnerable. And I guess more important, let us stop seeing asking for help as being a sign of weakness and let us see it as a sign of teaching our children and teaching ourselves that it's okay to need help we don't know everything and we can't do everything as much as we would like to think that we can um number three resilient people hold the belief that they can do something that will help them manage their feelings and to cope now this is a huge one so if you believe deep down that you have got yourself or that you can do something, that you there's something you can do to change the situation or you can ask the right person for help, that is one of the most empowering things that we can give to our children and also to ourselves. Um, feeling helpless, helpless, I don't know what to do. How am I going to survive? What is the next thing where, you know, are children hearing us getting stuck in that mode or do they see us acknowledging I am worried about my job. I do not know what's going to happen. And then they see us getting into action. So what am I going to do? Am I going to change something? Am I going to do something? So that they can see how we are empowering ourselves in those very difficult moments. Um, let them know that you believe in them. You know, I am going, well, or I was going through a really difficult situation and I phoned my parents. Um, so you can imagine me at 38 phoning my mom and dad in South Africa who are just trying to, you know, enjoy their, enjoy their evening. And I was crying on the phone with them. And it got to a point where I said to my parents, I said, do you think that I am strong enough to get through this? And, you know, my parents said all the right things. And they started speaking very genderly about, you know, and, and people and we can do. And I said, no, I need to hear from you that I, Rene, can get through this because you know me the longest of everyone in the world. And, they both just said to me, we believe that you can do this. You are strong enough. You are our child and you will get through this. And of course, I didn't believe them in that moment because I honestly did not think that I would be able to get through this. But it stuck in my mind. And the fact that they believed in me, the fact that they said, we know you and we know that you can do this, it, it really changed so much for me. And that made me think of... Imagine we could instill that feeling in our children from right now, that absolute belief that they can do something, that they are strong enough, that they will figure it out. Now, this is something that um, is, is, is maybe a little bit tricky for us to understand or to work with or to play with, but to give our children the confidence, and it's not a false confidence of, oh, you can just do everything. That confidence comes from us letting them solve problems. That confidence comes from us saying to them, you know what, I think you can figure this out. And if you can't, then come to me and I will help you. Again, we have to be age appropriate here. And what I say to my 12 year old is going to be very different to what I say to my three year old. But just to give them little moments and situations where we can say, you've got this, it's okay. And then when they make a mess or when they do fail, that you are there to help them clean it up. This is something also that I think is very important with, and something we can start with young children, and it starts in a very physical and practical way, that when they mess or when they do something or they spill water or whatever it is, or they've thrown their toys all over the, the house, to say, okay, you've made a mess, let's fix it. So with the young ones, it starts with that they have to then pack away all the toys that they played with, or they get a cloth and they wipe the water up. And in that way, that vocabulary of I made a mess and now I fix it, that we can start instilling that in a young age. And then that transforms to a belief later on in their life that, okay, I made a mess or I am in a huge mess, but I can fix it. So that is something that from young, just as that language of there's a mess, I can fix it. I mean, that is something that is incredibly powerful for children and that can transform into a real confidence and a real belief and a real certainty that, okay, there's a mess. I can now clean it and I can sort this out. Um, the fourth factor about 
resilient people. And the next two for me are very connected, especially with our children. Number four is they have social support available to them. And number five is they are connected with others such as family and friends. So the children are currently watching how we cope with misfortune, how we cope with change, how we cope with pain, how we cope with heartache, how we cope with fear. They are watching us be human through this process. None of us have been through this before. So we are also trying to figure it out. So let them see that, you know, their number one social support is mom and dad. Yeah. Family, tita, um, abuelo, aunts and uncles. I know we can't see each other and we're not interacting at the moment, but that is the, the first social support of these children. And then after that comes, you know, in Trinus with um, the Trinus family. And this is what is very, very important. So this is why it's, it's a good idea to stay connected with your community, to ask people for help, to let them see you talking to your friends and family on Zoom or on Skype or whatever it is. Let them see how you are caring for one another. You know, um, in terms of being age appropriate, you're not going to tell your four-year-old, no, we can't go visit um, Tita because thousands of people are dying of Corona and we don't want Tita to die. Yeah. But you can say to your four-year-old, you know, I'm also so sad that we can't go visit Tita today. I'm so sad. It also makes me want to cry. But, you know, we love her so much and we want to keep her safe. So just little ways you can change your language to make things age appropriate for them and to help them also understand that you understand what they are going through. Connection at this time, I mean, connection is the only thing. That is the only thing we have. We can't gather physically. We can't be in the classroom together. We, we, we don't have that closeness. So we need to find other ways to stay connected. And this is something that you might not think it, but it is going to help your children understand that we are not alone. We have a social circle around us. We have support. We have people we can go to ask to go to to ask for help we can people we have people we can go to to help us solve problems we have people who are older than us with more experience we are open to new ideas that is what the children need to see in this time and if there's one thing that we we, we cannot also well another thing that we cannot forget we cannot separate out of any discussion around adversity or what we're talking about now or building resilience is that we need to teach children that the only way is through. So you can't avoid it. You can't escape it. You can't um, buy yourself out of the situation. The, the thing you have to do is to go through it. So that is what they are going to see us trying to do. They are going to see us getting through this. And in that way, they will learn and see how it is possible to go through something. So we need to decide, are we showing our children healthy ways to go through? Are we trying to avoid? Are we trying to um, ignore? Are we putting our head in the sand? Are we acting like this is not happening? Are, are we a mess? Have we fallen apart? Or are we just getting through this? Now, something to remember, some good news is that Children are way more flexible and resilient than we could ever hope to be. Um, so whenever you are feeling like this is, or maybe you're listening to me because when I was writing this, I was like, oh my goodness, I mean, this is huge. Just remember, they are not like us. They are way more resilient and flexible. I'm sure that some of you can see in your own children ways that they are coping, things that they have done, and you cannot believe how well they are doing or how much better than you they seem to be doing. Um, they adapt quicker. You know, I've seen this in some very practical ways. For example, in Zoom, when we started in March, you know, I was the one with the most expertise because I had just heard about the app, quick, the, the, um, the platform before them, and I was presenting it. So for a while, I was very cool because I knew Zoom. And it it was less than a month that these children started discovering things. I mean, by now, I basically tell them, um, can someone tell me how to do this in Zoom? And they almost always already have the answer. There's not been a single thing that I've asked them where someone said, oh, I don't know. Any single feature, that's something that I've just thought of at the top of my head. And someone is there showing me exactly what to do and talking me through it. Um, another example is that when I moved to Guate, 
I started learning Spanish at the same time as a lot of the children I was working with were learning English. And <laughs> they inspired me to just care so much less about mistakes because they just jumped into it. Some of them were just speaking English with this freedom, making up words, making up sentences. And that's just what they did. And we laughed and I corrected the speech, but I had some children who just leapt. And that helped me because they laughed at me a hell of a lot. I mean, that was part of the deal that, you know, they just jumped in and I spoke the wrong words, which happened all the time and still does. They laughed at me and then they corrected me. So we went through that journey together and I realized it was so much easier for them than it was for me. That they had this, this freedom and this flexibility that I didn't have. So it is possible. And remember when we are thinking about what to do with ourselves, it's very different with our children. So however hard it is for, for us to do these things, to remember these things, just remember that it's going to be easier for your children. So. Um, unfortunately, I can't offer a step by step, this is how you build resilience or a how to guide of this is what you do and then later your child will be resilient because that's not how you cultivate a capacity. And that is what resilience is. It's a capacity. It's not just a, a, a thing that you have from, you know, doing nothing. You build resilience by being resilient. You build resilient resilience by being resilient because situations happen that are tough. Problems come up, um, <laughs> COVID arrives, you know, things happen and we only build resilience by going and getting through those things. So um, resilience is a capacity, it's a skill, it's a feeling, it's a trust in yourself and in life. Resilient comes from solving problems. It comes from getting through difficult situations. It doesn't come when things are easy. You don't need to be resilient. You didn't need to be resilient back in February 2020 when before this whole start, this whole thing started in, in Guatemala. We were just living our lives. Resilience is only a factor now because of the situation we are going through. So what I can offer is suggestions um, things that I have read and found online, things that have worked for other people across the world, things that I have seen and used, things that I am seeing and using. I mean, I, I'm giving this talk not because I'm a resilience expert, but because I am um, a resilience apprentice or a resilience learner. Like I, I'm, I'm also wanting to learn and, and figure out how am I going to get through this and how am I going to help my family, my friends and the children in my class how, how, what can we do to get through this? So um, I'm going to offer some suggestions of little things and, and practical tips that you can do um, with your family. Please do not, do not email me if your child is not resilient at the end of this. No, if you are not resilient at the end of this. This is only suggestions and ideas. Believe me, I also know that this is such an incredibly complicated moment and I don't want to complicate your life anymore. So that's why I'm saying if we can see as if we can look at it as how do I build my resilience, then your children's resilience will automatically increase just because of that. So let's let's look at it like that. What are things you think that can work for you or your family and what will help you be more resilient so that you can help your children see resilience in action? And family, and I, I can't say this enough, family is what is going to help our children get through this. That is what is going to help us get through this. And we cannot forget that children are our mirrors. So, I mean, even in my class, there's a few things that I've had to ban from the classroom because basically these children are now just giving me what I have been giving to them. So I'm also having to be a lot more aware of what I am doing and what I am saying because that's just being reflected back to me. So don't feel that it is um, you have such a heavy responsibility and burden to bear. It's not like that. For me, it's empowering that we are the ones who are responsible for teaching our children resilience. This is our moment to do that. We are not relying on the media or somebody else out there or our children are now at the mercy of no. They are in our care and we can guide and we can show them and we can figure it out together. 
So again, this is not now that you have to be the perfect, most resilient person ever. You're, that's not what it's about. What it's about is being real. It's about letting your children see you be human. And um, just to have that awareness, you know, do your children always see you complaining about the fact that your work is so terrible, it's so horrible that you have to do it now in this um, pandemic, you can't deal with your boss, you can't, do, do they hear you on that negative loop that, oh, and now I can't, and I still can't, and I can't, and I can't believe, and now the president said this, and now it's the semaphores, and now it's this, and now it's this, or do they hear you being frustrated, being human, trying something, it doesn't work, your job is incredibly uh, exhausting now because it's so much more difficult, and then do they see you doing things to change it? So do they see you complain about your day and then do they see you say, okay, now I'm home, I'm so happy, I'm ready to sit and I need a hug and let's cuddle and this is the family time and all of that. So just to have that awareness of what are your children hearing you say all the time? What is your perspective on what is going on? Another thing that is very important and that comes up a lot in um, talk about resilience and adversity is spirituality. Now that is something that you and your family decide what it, is that it looks like for you. So they, it could be a Christian family and your strength comes from God. And what you do is you pray and you pray as a family. It could be that it's Mother Earth and your appreciation is for the earth and the sun and the stars and the moon, but that your children see that you have this connection to something bigger. It can be if you're a Buddhist, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The, the thing is that this belief in a higher power that is somehow in control or that I can trust in. The fact that there's something that you can trust in can be incredibly powerful and healing for children. So again, it's not about, it must be this or it must be that. I mean, this is your family, it's your beliefs and all of those things, but don't forget how important that is. What are your children seeing you do or trusting or having faith in? Um, Gratitude practice. Now, this is something that, you know, we hear all the time. And what I do in my class is that um, I try and aim for a few times a week for everyone to say something that they are grateful for. Now, if you can find a few things that you are grateful for in the middle of this pandemic, you are already a lot better off than a lot of people around the world. And just that awareness of something that, you know, and my children will say things like, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my home. I'm grateful that I am healthy. I'm grateful that I have food. It's, it's these basic things. And if we can teach our children to recognize and appreciate those things, because sometimes, and especially now, I think it's those little things that are keeping us going. Uh, it, what's keeping us going is not the fact that we can afford to fly to whatever country for a holiday. No one's going anywhere. What's keeping us going is the fact that we have food in our in our um, in our homes. We are warm. We are safe. We are healthy. We can go to the doctor if we need to. It's those little little things that are are really keeping us all. I think in some kind of feeling of of being okay. So let's acknowledge that and let the children um, see us doing that. Then very quickly, some other things: awareness, checking on loved ones. You know, making a point of phoning Tita or let, and letting your child talk to them, even if the child doesn't want to. You know, a lot of the children don't want to be on the phone. They don't want to deal with Zoom. They don't want to do another video call. But just that they know that there's this awareness that we are checking on everybody. Are other people okay? So in that way, it's not only us focusing on our problems, but we are, we are open. We are part of the world still. We are still connected. Um, being aware of nature and beauty. You know, when things were at the worst, when we couldn't go anywhere, you know, just being able to go and walk on Las Americas, which is basically just this kind of strip between two busy roads. That was something that was just so incredibly powerful for me. Um, you know, I have now not seen a sunset at the beach since February, and I'm sure that a lot of us are in the same boat. And I cannot wait for my first sunset. So these little things you can look forward to, look at the changing flowers, look at the the trees outside your windows. Think about and the day when you will go to the beach, how amazing it will feel to have the sand in your toes. Let them connect to nature and beauty as another way to, to realize that, that we can trust in something bigger. I mean, nature is not affected by the virus. Nature is, is, keep, is keeping um, going and, and growing. And even 
doing better than ever before. And we've seen photos of animals who are now appearing in places they never were before. So nature is something that can inspire us to thinking bigger than ourselves, to thinking out of ourselves. Um, something I've always had in my classroom is a worry jar. And this could maybe be something that you could look at in your family. And basically it was just a little, um, a glass container. And when the children had a problem, they would write on the, on a piece of paper what the problem was and put it in so the first thing that or the first thing i like about that is that they learn to talk about their problems and that they, they don't have to deal with that face-to-face -face, um maybe pena or, or shyness of saying it they can write it down then they put it in the worry jar and once it's in there they know that i am going to um check it i'm going to read it and then um, I will be a part of helping them solve the problem. And what's interesting is that a lot of the times I didn't give children a solution to what they wrote. All I would do was give a hug and say, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Or I would say, okay, um, have you tried doing this or something like that? Not even saying this is what you have to do to fix your problem. Just the idea that they can talk about their problems and they can share that and that someone can help them fix it. Um, last night I had a meeting with my parents of the class and one of the moms told us about an activity that the family does and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. So they have an activity jar and everyone writes an activity and it gets put in the jar. And the rule is that the activity, whatever is pulled out, is done by everyone with no complaints. Now, this is just to me the most incredible thing. Imagine the possibilities. The four-year-old writes on a piece of paper, I want to play hide and seek. Hide and seek gets pulled and now the father, mother, everyone is playing hide and seek. That four-year-old is not sitting there thinking, I feel so empowered right now. I did this and now this is happening. But the four-year-old will never, ever, ever forget the sight of their father playing hide and seek just because that was their idea. Even better than that, imagine the teenage 12-year-old brother or sister who is way too cool to play hide-and-seek. Imagine the humility and absolute restraint that that teenager is going to practice as they suck it up and suffer through hide-and-seek, which is the lamest thing, but they will do it because they know that at some point the activity that gets pulled out from the jar could be theirs. So if that doesn't build resilience, learning to suffer through hide and seek with your four-year-old um, brother or sister having to act excited for it, I mean, that is something that it's a, it's a funny and a silly example, but that's a very powerful lesson in sucking something up and just going through it and knowing that at the end of it, there might be a reward because your activity might get pulled next. So there are different ways and little things that we don't know how they will actually affect the children. So think about how do you deal with the wrong answer. Think about teaching your children not what to think, but how to think. So if there's a problem to encourage them, okay, what would you do and, and what do you think? So that they we don't tell them always this is what you need to do. Um, connection, letting them sense and feel family support, letting them feel loved. That is another thing that's going to build resilience because it's going to help them move through something, knowing that they have people they can trust and knowing that they are loved. Um, let them know how or give them opportunities to show their gratitude. You know, so um, donating books, old books, old toys, donating clothes that's too small is another way that we can say, okay, this is the pandemic. There's not much we can do, but we can do this. We can give out toys to children who don't have anything. You know, buying a pizza for the security at your building. You know, that's another way that you are showing, you know, we, we have, um, we have a lot, we have so much and we can share and we can do something, a small thing that's going to help somebody else. That also turns that focus then outwards again. You know, that resilience is not just I'm getting through it, but also I can, I can help other people through this as well. How do um, 
we express our feelings. How can we get children to express their feelings? So you can ask, you know, what color are you today for the younger ones? What animal do you feel today? Older ones, you can say, well, what word do you feel today? And if they can't find a word, you know, helping grow their vocabulary so that they can become open to expressing themselves. You know, what color do you think anger would be? So in that way, we can help our children start to understand feelings. Keep the connection alive. Let them talk to their friends. Let them call their cousins. Let them make cards for family members. Let them make cards for their teachers. Let them make cards or something or send cupcakes to someone to keep that connection and to, to help your children make somebody else's day a bit brighter. So not only are we then teaching them resilience, but we're showing them how we can do something beautiful and something special and how we can care for other people. Um, just quickly things like apologizing when you're wrong. Um, you know, let them, let's show them how do we apologize and how do we do that sincerely and in a good way? How do we make mistakes? How do we cope with making mistakes? How do we cope with not knowing? How do we cope with asking for help? These are the things that are really going to make a big difference for our children. Um, <laughs> I think that's, I don't know, Gabby, if there's any questions or anything. Thank you, Rene. That was really <laughs> Beautiful what you said, what you taught us today. Um, we have a few comments here that I'm going to read. Just hold on a second. And if you have any question or any comment, please be free to write it on the chat and we will be with you. Let me see. Okay, this is a very beautiful comment. Um, Priska really said, let the children get involved in problem solving to find solutions rather than shielding them. Seeing the mistakes we make is absolutely necessary. I concur with your statements. You wrote that when you were at the beginning of the... And we have here an, a question. I believe you were uh, on the step number two of of how to be a, how to be resilient. Uh -huh. And she asked. Is it bad to redo it, redo it after them, not in front of them, but later when they are <laughs> What do you have um, to say to her? I, I think that it depends on what it is and how obvious it will your intervention will be. Yeah. So that is something, you know, if your your child um did something and they're gonna wake up and it's going to be totally different. Yeah. That I would say is not good. I would say only change it totally if you say to them, hmm, I think, don't you think it would be better if? So don't let them do something and then wake up the next day and you've changed it completely. That I don't think is um, is healthy for them because then maybe they will start thinking, okay, it doesn't matter. that It, it will magically change overnight. So if you want to change something, I, oh, I'd love to know what, exa what exactly you were talking about. I think that changing something with a child, not because saying, um, you know, I wouldn't have done it this way. Yeah, not that. Uh, this is not going to work because, uh, hmm, don't you think it would be better if, or you know what, I'm just going to move this from here to there. What do you think now? So whoever wrote that, if you can put an example, I'd love to know. But I do think it's a very valid question because I don't think it would be a good idea for a child to wake up the next day and everything is totally different. What you can do is you can say to them, you know, um, while you're asleep, I'm going to make this even better. Yeah. And then leave something of the original idea, of course, depending on what it was. Um, you know, you're not going to, if they put something weird in the supper, you're not going to let the family eat the poison or whatever. So you have to practice restraint. But I don't think we should totally change something um, that they don't know about. I don't, I don't think that that's very empowering for the children. <laughs> but it would be quite funny. I'm going to add something, Rene. Uh, something similar happened to me. Well, when we started the pandemic and we were in lockdown, my girls started doing, making their own bed mm -hmm. in the morning because we had... Ah, uh, yes, time. okay. Parent examples, yeah? Yeah. And, um, of course, at the beginning, they were doing it well, you know, they were doing <laughs> like they were able to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was like this close to go and redo it. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought about this because Katya, my oldest, was told, uh, caught me 
redoing the bed. <laughs> and she was like, mom, if you're going to do it, why, why are you asking us to do it? Why don't you do it if you do it better than us? Perfect. So yeah. I was like, okay, so yeah. I need to, I need to let, let that go yeah. and just let them do their bed and they're going to keep do it better every every day because they're going to be practicing and they're going to be making an effort to do it better. Exactly. So who am I to judge if they are doing it better? It's their bit. It's not my bit. I do my bit. Exactly. So exactly. I thought about this. So if this maybe answers the question to that's a very good example. And that's how clever this. children are. Yeah. Well, mom, you know, if, if you're just going to do it anyway, why do I? Why they're amazing. Yeah. Why, why am I going to? <laughs> Make the effort if you know how to do it yeah, better. Yeah. So it's like sending the wrong message. Very good example. Okay. Um, there's another comment here that says, uh, being grateful makes us happy. So important to remember. Very important. Very important. Yeah, I agree with that. And there's another comment that says, worry dark. I like that idea. So I think we're going to copy that. <laughs> good. We're going to have it in our house a, a worry dark. Um, I think that's about it. I don't know if you have something else to add. Um, just to remember, we're going to get through this. And it's going to be um, <laughs> officially from Ms. P. I'm telling you, it's going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> I 